Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Park Community Church in Bridgeport. My name is Jared. I'm one of the uh, worship team leaders here. Uh, if you would uh, please find your seat and then uh, rise as we uh, start uh, singing two songs. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Sing holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show.
Amen. Uh, Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. That's an important thing, to not only desire to confess our sins, but to forsake them. Let's pray this together as the people of God. Holy God, you have given us many good gifts. We thank you for all of them, especially the gift of Jesus. We deserve death because of our sin, but you freely give us life in Jesus. Give us grace to live for you and not ourselves, and make us more like your perfect Son, Jesus Christ. Sing His mercy is more. What love could remember no wrongs we have done? Omniscient, all knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Sing praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. So tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Sing praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins. They are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many his mercy is more so lord we praise you this morning that uh, despite our weakness despite our sins. Uh, your mercy is always more. Your mercy is greater. And uh, we just come to you this morning seeking your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning and welcome to Park Community Church Bridgeport. My name is Kate. If you haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'd love to meet you after service. Once again, 
Um, welcome. One of my favorite things about the community we have here at Park is just the relationships that I've been able to build. And building those relationships starts here on Sunday morning, even just taking a moment to greet those around us. So before you grab a seat, find someone new, hopefully that you haven't met before, introduce yourself, and if you need an icebreaker, ask what they're doing this weekend. All right, I see some of you have drifted pretty far from your seats. That's awesome. Let's resume those conversations after service. All right. Once again, welcome to Park Bridgeport. We are so thankful that you are spending your Sunday morning here with us, especially on a holiday weekend. Here at Park, we seek to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people until there's no place left. If you're new with us, or if uh, this is like maybe your second or third time visiting with us, uh, we would love for you to visit our Connect Bar in the back after service. One of our amazing Connections volunteers would love to help Fill, help, help you fill out a Connect card. Uh, if you give us your name and your email, we'd love to send you a long email about all the ways you can get connected here at Park, but then also take you out for a free cup of coffee, see how we can better serve you as a church and get you connected. At this time, I'd like to dismiss our kids to the loop ministry. If your kids are still with you in the seats, you can go ahead and send them back to the teachers who will take them to their classroom. Anybody else moving? Okay. Um, Every fall, um, as students are returning to school, uh, I, still have, I personally still have the nostalgic feeling of being excited to begin a new season, learning new information, solidifying new relationships. Um, quick show with hands, anyone with me on that? Like the fall, you're like, okay, I've procrastinated things over the summer, I can do it now in the fall, yeah. All right, well the good news is, we here at Park have opportunities for you to take next steps here in the fall season. Uh, the first option that I would like to discuss is to join a small group. If you want to scan the QR code that's on the screen now, it will fill you out. It will take you to a link where you can fill out some information. Um, but if you know me at all, you know that I can't stop talking about my small group and how much I love all the small groups I've been a part of over the past few years here at Park. Um, but if you haven't been a part of small group, I would really encourage you that this is an awesome way to deepen relationships and grow in your relationship with Christ. Through my small groups, I've laughed, I've cried, I've confessed, I've prayed, uh, and really just gotten to know my brothers and sisters in Christ in a new way. Um, and in doing so, been able to better see the body of Christ and how and why God loves me. So again, if you have any questions about a small group, I'd love to talk to you, uh, our Connect Bar would love to talk with you, or just scan the QR code on the screen. If you're interested in a different way to grow in your faith, uh, we are relaunching our Park Academy this fall as well. So Park Academy is offered across all of the park locations. They all come together on Wednesday evenings for 10 weeks in a row at our Near North location. There's discussion, there's actually homework that you have to do. If you can't make it in person, there are some virtual options that are also on the screen. But the real heart behind Park Academy 
is to form the minds and shape the hearts of the participants so that they can be better equipped to live out and share the gospel. If this sounds like something that you could be interested in, please fill out a Connect card at the back and we would love to get you more information about how to get set up. As we transition to a time of prayer before the sermon, I'd like to remind everyone that while we no longer pass a physical offering bag due to COVID, the spiritual discipline of tithing is beneficial and expected of every Christian. If you have questions about tithing or why we tithe, please feel free to reach out to Kenson or our elder, Paul Boy. Uh, if you don't know how to get a hold of them, once again, connect card in the back. It's your ticket to all information. There's also information on the TVs about how to give to Park. I'd like to do something a little different for our prayer today. Many of you may know that violence in our city increases during the summer and also worsens around holiday weekends. In light of this, I was asked to pray for shalom in our city. Shalom is a way of saying wholeness or to be complete. It isn't just peace or an absence of violence, but to be holy and fully satisfied. I was looking at passages that talk about the way our God offers us shalom, and the most powerful example I saw is the way that God gives us his own son, Jesus. So please join me as I pray through an adaptation of Isaiah 9, 2 to 7, which talks about the shalom offered through Jesus. Father, you, pray, you promise that those walking and living in darkness shall see light and experience a dawning of hope. We pray that those in our city living in darkness, despair, and hopelessness would experience your goodness, mercy, and light. We pray that the church would bless their neighbors and seek the good of their neighbor and their cities. May that begin with us in these seats today. You promise that you will provide for us, and not only provide for us, but offer us joy and bounty beyond what we can imagine. You promise that the yokes which oppress us shall be thrown off. Father, we pray against the enemy and the spiritual chains which entangle each of us in our seats today. Would we cling to you, and through your word, prayer, and community, cast off that which ensnares us and run the race you have set for us? Would we as a church be a part of organizations which are breaking down systems which oppress our brothers and sisters of color and promote equality, dignity, and humanity for all? You promise that the need of violence and war will cease because unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. We pray for the violence in our communities. We know there are many systems which contribute to the cycles of violence. But Jesus, we pray that, the heart, that hearts would be changed and violence would cease as people of our city learn of your great love for us. May we in these seats be faithful ministers to, of your gospel and faithful supporters of those individuals and organizations which are more deeply connected to neighborhoods where violence is more prevalent. You promise of the greatness of your government and the peace you will provide. O oh Lord, we long for the everlasting shalom that only you can provide. We pray that we would love our neighbors enough to step outside our comfort zones to offer this shalom to them. May we rest secure despite our own spiritual struggles, knowing that you are responsible for accomplishing this and that we can trust in your word. Father, we pray all this in your name. Amen. Hi, everybody. My name is Pastor Rafe Chenry. If I haven't met you, I pastor our Park South Loop location, and uh, Kenson is over at Park South Loop preaching uh, as well today, so we're at each other's churches, and it's nice to be with you this morning, as I get to do regularly. Go ahead, open your Bibles to Psalm 36. Psalm 36, as we continue our series through the book of Psalms. A few years ago, <clears throat> I had this funny moment. I was, uh, I, I took my oldest daughter to the park with me. Now, there's a particular park in University Village where they have like pull-up bars and a rope and kind of a little workout spot. 
And so sometimes when I get back from work, I'll take my kids with me to that park, and it's a way for me to kind of watch the kids and get a workout at the same time. And this particular day, we're walking to the park, and uh, I see that there's this guy working out on the pull-up bars. And I'm, pu- I'm getting up there. I only have my oldest. She's got to be about four at the time. And, uh, and he's got his shirt off. And this guy is about six foot eight, built like a gladiator. He looks like he could play tight end for the Bears. I mean, he's just this massively strong man. And we get closer, and uh, as we're getting closer to the, the pull-up bar, my, my oldest looks at me, and, and she says, Dad, I thought you said you were the strongest guy in the world. <laughs> so I looked at her, I said, sweetie, I am. And she said, but he's stronger than you. I said, no, he's not. <laughs> what are you talking about? And I proceeded to have the best workout I've ever had in my entire life showing off my daughter. There are times in our life when you realize you've been fooled, isn't there? There are times in your life when you've been believing one thing and then the fact of the matter stands right in front of you and you suddenly say, I was wrong. Uh, it's easy to get fooled. And in the Christian life, in the Christian life, it's particularly easy to get fooled because there is a great deceiver who is out for Christians and out for the world specifically to deceive them. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. The name the devil literally means divider. That's the, that's the backing of that, that name, the etymology of the word the devil. He divides. And the devil's plan is to literally sell darkness as light. He is the great marketer of human history. He, He's taking what is wrong and he's packaging it in such a way that we actually believe at times and we're fooled into believing it's right when in reality it's just death being sold as life. It's easy to get fooled. And I wonder in your Christian life, if you've been a follower of Christ for any amount of time, I have a feeling that you've experienced what I've experienced over the course of my Christian life, which is there's, there's times when you realize you've been believing a lie. Or you've been, you've been participating in, in something that you thought was good, something that looked decent, that didn't look like that bad, and then a little time goes by, and all of a sudden, it's just standing right in front of you. You can't deny it. This is wrong. I know it's wrong. And then you have that choice to make, don't you? Well, do I just play it off like it's not that big a deal? Just stay going down the path I was on? Does God really care? Or do I repent? Do I turn? Do I say, no, I've been fooled. I know what this is. I'm turning in a new direction. It's easy to get fooled. Today I'm preaching on the theme of the foolishness of sin. And in fact, uh, Psalm 36, verse 1. Hey, Kevin, can I get a glass of water, please? I'm going to need that. Thank you so much. Psalm 36, verse 1 says this. Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. Now, that is one very fine translation. Our ESV Bibles in English are very, very good translations. But actually, it's a very complicated Hebrew verse, and it's very difficult. And different translations, if you kind of look at the different translations out there, they'll take this in slightly different directions. So, for example, thank you so much, Kevin. One other way to translate this would read this. Verse 1, an oracle within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. An oracle within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. And and if that's the right way to translate this, what Psalm 36 is 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 an oracle concerning the sinfulness of wickedness. It's taking a, a big picture of you. Let's expose sinfulness for all it is and wickedness for all it is. Now, it's interesting. We've actually been on three weeks now looking at sin in different directions. We looked at sin in terms of how God disciplines us when we look at sin. We've looked at sin in terms of the, the wickedness uh, and, and the, the death that accompanies sin. And now we look at it from a big picture in all of its fullness. And one of the best ways to see it, actually, what the, the flow of what the author is getting after in Psalm 36 is just to look at the whole psalm for a sec. So before we even read it, let me walk you through the, the kind of outline of this, of this passage. Verses 1 to 4 highlight this downward spiral of sinfulness that we'll walk through. So here's sin, and here's how deep it goes and what it looks like. Then you get to the first paragraph break. Verses 5 and 6 are this, this deep look at God's, God's attributes. So it's contrasting. Here's sinfulness against the perfectness, the perfection of God. 
And then out of looking at the perfection of God, then we go to verses 7 to 9, that next paragraph break, and that's going to say, okay, if, if God's perfection is as good as I just said, here's the blessings of the Christian life. So here's, what it, here's all the fullness of what it looks like to live under his perfection. And he closes in verses 10 through 12 with this prayer, oh God, may we never, may we never find ourselves in sin and all of its consequences, but may we stay in, in life and underneath God and all of its consequences. So I think the big idea of this passage is something like this. Every person, every person is either going to be fooled by the house of sin or feasting in the house of God. There's no in between. You're either fooled in the house of sin or you're feasting in the house of God. Let's read the whole passage together. Starting in verse 1, we read this. Transgression speaks to the wicked. Deep in his heart, there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself up in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. And now we move into the, the, the contrasting to look at the, the doctrine of God, his attributes. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. Now we move into the blessings of mankind because of those attributes. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. Hear that language? And you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. I love that phrase. In your light do we see light. And here's his prayer. Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of wicked, the, the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. Part one, we're going to focus in on verses one to four and look at this downward spiral of sin. What's the big idea? We're all either fooled, we're, we're either uh, fooled in the house of sin or feasting in the house of God. I want to look at that fooled in the house of sin by looking at verses one to four. It begins in verse 1 by saying this, there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's how all this starts. And then he's going to go into these five ways that sin works itself out. But it starts this way. There's no fear of God in their eyes. Now, when we talk about fear of God, what do we mean? Well, there's kind of two attributes to it, okay? Two ways to think of the fear of God. On the one hand, you have this, this utter respect for the seat of authority that God has, it's a bit like if you were living in Chicago and you just got a job at a Fortune 500 company and you're in your first week on the job and the CEO of the company calls you the, the, his office on the top floor of the Sears Tower and he says, come on up, I want to meet you. Now, if you're the new guy that just started, 21-year-old person living in Chicago in a Fortune 500 CEO company, his corner office, there's a certain level of humility and, and trembling when you walk into his office, right? You're not going to goof around. You're not going to be a little silly like you might be in your cubicle because you have a healthy respect for the seat that he holds and the authority he has over you as an employee. In the same way, when we talk about the fear of God, we, we recognize the seat of authority that God has as he governs the universe and holds our souls. Okay? There's a hel healthy sense of, I'm not going to goof around when it comes to my, my Christian faith. This is no trivial matter. God's not a joking matter. I'm going to have an, a, a respect for his authority. But that's not it. There's this other side to the fear of the Lord that's more than just respect. It's actually fearing God. Listen to how Jesus says it, Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, our modern, gentle, sensitive, evangelical ears, I think oftentimes abuse the term fear of the Lord to mean something that the biblical authors did not intend. It is right to have a proper fear of God. Why? Well, because every one of us is going to face our judgment seat one day. The book of Hebrews says it's given for man to live once, then die, and then face judgment. And wherever you are, whatever you believe today, if you're coming in this room and you're not a Christian, you're an agnostic, you're an atheist, you're a Buddhist, it doesn't matter what you believe. The scriptures are clear. All will face that judgment seat. 
And what we do with Jesus Christ in this life, whether we receive his forgiveness or reject it, has everything to do with what our judgment will be like. And there is a healthy, right fear of God that we're supposed to have in this life. And if you don't have that fear of God in your life, or you're going through life, and, it, and, and you, you, you kind of have this idea of God, but there's no real fear of him, well, then verses 1 to 4 apply to you. If you don't have a fear of God, here's verses 1 to 4. It, it outlines this downward spiral of sin that's rooted in no fear of God. First one, what's the first thing we do when you don't fear God? Well, you flatter yourself. Verse 2, he flatters himself in his own eyes, Okay. Well, how do we flatter ourselves? Well, when you don't fear God, you elevate yourself into this position of God. You think you're the center of the universe. You write your own rules. You write your own life. You write your own destiny, right? You, you, you don't follow God's ways because who's he? There's no fear of him. It, it's you. Let's pick on modern culture a little bit. How do we fear God? Well, we flatter themselves. They flatter themselves when they determine that their ways are good and right, that they're an overall good moral person, and certainly God's not going to judge them because of the sin they have in their life, okay? Modern day culture. They're flattering themselves. There's no fear of God. That's not biblical. They flatter themselves by denying that God is just and that eternal separation from God in hell is the just and right punishment for sin, All right? What are we doing when we soften the word? We're just flattering ourselves. We're making our, we're making our lives look a whole lot better and believing they're a whole lot better than they actually are. They flatter themselves that their knowledge is superior to the biblical authors. You know, I like, I like that part of what Jesus said, but I don't, you know, when he talked about that issue and that issue, I think we can do better today in our modern day than what those biblical authors wrote. You think you're going to do better than God? We think we're going we're, we're to write a better society than God's vision? What is it? We're just flattering. There's no fear of God. We're flattering ourselves. We're better. We can figure this thing out. They flatter themselves by calling God's vision of the society and the family repressive, right? What does God say about how the family ought to be designed, about what a marriage looks like, about, about what it means for a family to be the healthy building block of society? I think, you know what? That's repressive. Let's, let's create a, a new doctrine, a, a new set of ideals and values and visions because I think we can build society better than God. It, I, I should be scratching at this moment on very sensitive issues for you, and I am intentionally going there. What, why, what, what are we doing when we think we can redesign God's fabric for society? We're flattering ourselves. We're just flattering ourselves. Why? Because there's no fear of God. If you fear God, then you don't dare rewrite how he's designed the family, right? They flatter themselves by appointing new prophets, public voices who champion the postmodern ideal of my truth and your truth versus God's truth, right? That's common language today. Well, this is my truth. This is your truth. No, actually, it's the truth. It's God's word. That's the truth. There's no departing from the, the truth. You can't have, it, it's illogical. But this is the, the, the common thing that's being pushed through our public school system and our public library system and our, our books that we read, Right? And, and what is it? What, what's happening in that moment? We're, we're, we're revealing that we don't fear God, and it's the first step after not fearing God. We just flatter ourselves. <laughs> That's it. We're just flattering ourselves. What's the next one? That his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit, verse 3. Okay, so you start flattering, and now your words start to reveal that you're flattering yourself. I'm going to take you through a little journey here. Let's take a, a real obvious overt sin, something that, that everyone in this room should agree, this is just an overt sin, okay? Let's take someone who's thinking about having an affair on their spouse, okay? How does, how does this work? And I've walked through a number of times with people, and I've watched them go down this path, and the devastation that comes in their life and their family's life as a result. How does it begin? Well, first, there's no fear of God, right? I'm sitting there having a conversation saying, hey, hey, man, Start, start with God on this one. Fear's not there. Then they're flattering themselves. And what are they saying? Well, you know, I'm a little better than this marriage I've entered into. That's flattering yourself. And then you go down to this. Then you start speaking trouble. Now, now, now it's not just flattering yourself. Now, now you've got some buddies around you, and you're chattering, and they're chattering, and you're feeding. Because when you start to chatter about sin, you form circles of sin, and then you start to get amped up about it. 
and you think you're the one who's been un- unjustly undignified, okay? You guys know how this works, right? Sometimes you find yourself in that circle where all of a sudden you realize, man, this is just gossip. What am I doing? I'm creating circles and cycles of sin. Been fooled. We speak trouble. What's the third one? The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. This is a toxic downward descent of sin. That's how it always works. You're speaking trouble. And now notice, that's not actively doing sin. It's, 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 stopping from, it's stopping from doing the right thing. They cease to do the right thing. So how does this work out in the man having the affair? Well, as a married man, you've got certain boundaries you put up, healthy boundaries, okay? There's guards that you put up to make sure that you, you know, okay, as a married man, I'm not crossing these, these guards. Well, over time, you start, those guards come down. You, know, you start flattering yourself. You're chattering about sin. Guards start coming down, okay? Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. What's happening? You're just acting like a fool, And anyone who fears God who's in your life can see it very clearly. They know the devastation that's coming your way and everyone around you. You're on this toxic downward descent to sin. Number four, verse four, he plots trouble while on his bed. Now you're laying in bed in the morning and you're just dreaming, okay? Your guards have come down and now your mind is going, what could I do? What what kind of life could I have if 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 I... if I broke free from God's restraints in my life, okay? Number five, he sets himself in a way that is not good. Now you're positioning yourself for evil. So you're thinking about it. Now you're putting yourself in harm's way. And then number six, he does not reject evil. And now you're, you're, you're all in. And, and, and this is the downward descent of all sin. And, and what I want to say at this point is this. I've picked on adultery because I think it's one that we can all kind of trace this through. We can see it and the wicked kind of downward descent. Maybe you've experienced this before, but this is how all sin works, light or small. Alcohol. Let's pick another obvious one, alcohol. I, I, I know how alcohol works, right? I have a lot of alcoholism in my family. The Lord rescued me out of this. When I was 18 years old, total different direction. He rescued me. God changes the course of your life. He gets full victory where there, was, where there was total brokenness. But you know how this happens, Christian? All of a sudden, you find yourself, you know, flattering yourself. It's okay. I can, I can have a, a few more. And then all of a sudden, it's an everyday thing. It's, it's a few more. And, and, you, and what's happening? It's this downward, it's this downward spiral that others can look at and see it. It's just like the affair. They can see it, but, but then it starts manifesting itself. And just like alcohol, all sin does this. What, what does sin promise? Remember, the devil is the, um, he's the great marketer. He's selling death as light. And so, so why, do we, why do we go to alcohol? Why, why, do we, why do people go to get buzzed or to get drunk? Well, because it, it, it feels good in the moment. It feels like salvation in a way. You're not funny? You'll be the life of the party. At least you'll think you're funny. You're not good looking enough. Well, at least you're going to think you're the best looking guy in the room that night. Okay? But then what happens? You have this moment where sin feels satisfactory, but then you wake up the next day, and not only do you have a hangover, you physically feel the effects of sin, but then you look back and you start thinking, what did I do last night? Who did I harm last night? And, and the worst effect of sin is this. When the further you go down this spiral, you're getting numb to God. It's just numbing you to the glory of God and the purpose of your life, Christian. So I'm speaking to the Christian right now on a Sunday morning gathered for church. And, and, and definitely there is a way to look at this when you're, you're speaking to the wicked. And it's those who are not followers of Christ, who have rejected God. There's no fear of God in their life. And you can look out and you know there's just brokenness. And it's easy to highlight this in a non-believer's life. And if you're not a believer in Jesus this morning, I, I'm, I'm preaching to you as well. I'm telling you, look, the path you're on is going to lead to more death, more pain in your life and the people that, that love you. And it's going to start by changing the first part. You need a fear of God in your life. Trust God. He knows what he's doing. But to the Christian, in here on a Sunday morning, you're not off the hook. 
Because we have this, this attachment to the flesh and wickedness where it plays itself out in the same, the same spiral in our life. And that's why the Christian, anywhere you see habits of sin working in your life or, or working in someone else's life that you know and love in this church, you've got to root that out. Don't let it linger. Because as it lingers, Satan just keeps pouring this lie into you where it's like, it's okay, it's, it's okay, it's actually good, it's not a problem. And you stop being able to hear the other voices and slowly it descends into sin. I have pastorally walked with far too many people who have broken major parts of their life and it started with something light. And I'm pleading with you not to let verses one to four play out in your life. It all begins with no fear of God. Okay, that's the downward spiral of sin. But now that's contrasted against the goodness of God. So all of us, we're either doing this, we're, we're, we're fooled in the house of sin or we're feasting in the house of God. Now remember, he's gonna contrast that against these attributes of God. One of my passions as a pastor is to form doctrine. That's one of the reasons the academy that you guys just heard advertised a little earlier, that that is to form deep, deep roots in the doctrine of, of Scripture so that we can think rightly about God and then live properly in front of God, okay? He begins by contrasting sin against the attributes of God, and he lists out four attributes. The first one is this, steadfast love. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. That phrase, steadfast love, it's his Hebrew term, hesed love, hesed love. And it's talking about godly love. Now, all through the Old Testament, this idea of hesed love, it, it, it stands for steadfast love and loyalty. It stands for covenantal love. If you know the story of Ruth, uh, when Ruth displays her love to Naomi by saying, I'm going to forsake where I came from and the comfort I could have in order to stay with you, Naomi, and, and I'm going to give up everything I have to just serve you and make sure you're taken care of. That's described as a form of hesed love. When David and Jonathan covenant with each other, and they say, we're going we're gonna to be like, like brothers to each other, and we're going to make sure that we stand by each other and don't let either of us fall without the other person helping. That's a form of covenantal love, of, of hesed love. If you're finding yourself in this room today and you're wondering what the fullness of love is, it's, it's God's hesed love. There's a very famous ancient Scottish divine named Ralph Erskine. He talks about God's love this way. He says, God has taken a marvelous way to manifest his love. He says, when he would show his power, he makes a world. When he would display his wisdom, he puts it in a frame and, and a form that, that, that discovers its vastness. When he would manifest the grandeur and the glory of his name, he makes a heaven and he puts angels and archangels and, and principalities and powers therein. And when God would manifest his love, what will he not do? God has taken a great and marvelous way of manifesting it in Christ, his person, his blood, his death, his righteousness. If you want to understand God's steadfast love, you look to Jesus Christ, who's God incarnate. And what does Christ do for us on the cross? He's demonstrating the fullness of his love. You want to know the fullness of God's love for you? God sent Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to become sin on your behalf. Jesus hanging on a cross, think of that thorny crown, just digging nails into his brow. Think of his hands being pinned to the cross, his feet being pinned to the base of that cross. Think of his heaving as he's literally choking on the liquid in his own body. That's how you die in crucifixion. It's a, it's a drowning in your own bodily fluids. If you want to know what love is, look to the Messiah dying on your behalf that all of your sin could be paid for in order that you could be his beloved because you were separated from it in your, in your sin. All of that downward spiral of sin, that was your life. But God shows his love for us and that he sent Jesus Christ to die for you on a cross and he gives you full pardon if you just place your faith in Jesus. It's grace upon grace for sinners like me and sinners like you. The fullness of hesed love over the summer, I, I had a, a sabbatical. I met this very interesting man, a police officer in Florida, and he shared his story with me of when he was a young man. And he, he, in his 20s, his early 20s, he had one foot in Christianity and one foot kind of out of Christianity. He told me this marvelous story. He said, one day I, I was being reckless and I had a motorcycle and I was driving about 100 miles an hour and I crashed it into a car. 
and I flew off my motorcycle and I died. He said, I was laying there on the ground and I had died. And I, I woke up before Jesus. He said, I had an absolute, he goes, it wasn't just a vision, I was, I was with the Lord. He said, Rafe, in that moment, I was fully loved. He said, I can't tell you anything else about the experience except this. I'm standing before Jesus, and I didn't have to be anything. I didn't have to prove anything. I didn't have to, to prove to him that I loved him. I didn't have to, to do anything to tell him I loved him. I didn't have to, there was nothing I could do to get more love. There was nothing I could be to get more love. I was just saturated in the goodness and the love of God. And I'm looking Jesus in the eye, and I, and I just cried out, Oh, I love you, Lord. He goes, and then at that moment, I woke up in the real world. And he goes, and I was disappointed to wake up in the real world. He goes, and they took me to a hospital. They said I'd never walk again. Three weeks later, I walked out of the hospital. And I, and I, think, and I think there's a picture there of God's hessed love for you. When you put your faith in Jesus, you don't have to prove anything to him. You don't have to be anything to him. You don't have to earn any, there's not, you can't earn any more with him. The fullness of God's love is poured in you because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross, grace upon grace, welcome to love. You can't find that anywhere else. There's no religion that will offer you that on this planet except for Christianity. That's it. Number two, his faithfulness. His faithfulness. Your faithfulness is to the clouds. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant. What does faithfulness mean? It means reliability, immovableness, steadfastness. He's like a mountain. That's how he's described all through scripture. The mountain of God. It's this idea of if you gotta, if you gotta anchor yourself on something that's not gonna move, anchor your, anchor your flag in the mountain of God. It's not, it can't be moved. He's faithful. He's not changing. He's not going anywhere. His promises are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, if you know his faithfulness, what does that do in your life? Well, if you know his faithfulness, that, that means that whatever you go through in life, if you've got your flag planted in God's faithfulness, what is man going to do? What's this world going to throw at you? If you're loved that much, now when storms come your way, you ever seen a Christian go through a storm? A real Christian, someone who's anchored in the faithfulness to go through a storm? Because they come. There, there's this contentedness in the midst of the storm. That's why Paul could be, have the audacity to, to, to say something like this. Uh, find joy in your trials. Consider it pure joy when you experience trials of various kinds. James chapter 1. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. How can he do it? Well, because he knows the steadfastness of God, the faithfulness of God. If that's not you... Here's what you need to do with the attributes of God. You need to meditate on them. It's an, old, it's an old fashioned doctrine. You need to take a verse like your faithfulness is to the clouds and just linger in that one for a half an hour on a Sabbath day. And just consider his faithfulness. Number three, your, your righteousness is like the, the mountains of God. What's righteousness? It, it means that he's blameless. Everything he does is right. There, there's no wrongdoing in God. If you believe that, that whatever God does in your life, it's an opportunity to become more like God. He's in control of your life. He does not make a mistake. Every, every terrible, tragic, hard thing you walk through in this life, he, he's looking at you and he's saying, I know what I'm doing. And I know it doesn't look like it, but I need you to see that I know what I'm doing. My righteousness is like the mountains. Just, just stay with me on this. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Number four, his justice. Your judgments are like the great deep. God has perfect justice. And God's justice is unique. We, we try to redefine justice. God's got a definition of justice. And, and he's taking all things into consideration. Now, some of you are in this room today, and you're saying, I hear this preacher up here, and I hear what he's saying, but what I really want to know is this, is the God he's speaking about. Is he able to, to speak to the way my father treated me when I was a kid? That, that's, that's what you're saying. You're in here right now. You're saying, I hear it. I hear you saying it. And it all sounds good about his love and all. But what does he have to say about the way my dad treated me? Because you're carrying that wound with you. And here's what he has to say. His justice is like the deep. That's the same word in Genesis chapter 1 where it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the deep. 
He sees all, he knows all, and his justice will be perfect. There's nothing that's ever happened to you in your life that God does not know in full and that will not have a full accounting and justice paid for, either in this life or the next. He knows all of it. You're in here today and, and you're wondering, what is, what, is that, what is that God that that preacher is talking about have to do with, with what happened to me that I've never told anybody anything about? And it's just like this wound. Here's, here's what that God has. He offers you healing that nothing else in this world can heal. He offers you full healing because Jesus Christ went to the cross not for you to live in partial victory of the wounds in your life, but full victory, to give you the Holy Spirit, to know that his plan of justice is perfect. He will have justice. And as that justice approaches its day, he's going to bring healing into your life through the Holy Spirit. That's what my God can do. Some of you have overcome tremendous wounds in your life, and others in this room are still battling through them. Cling to the God and to our God and all of his attributes. You need these attributes. And look, if you know them, now there's blessings that come into your life. Let me give you just one of them. I only have time for one of them. I think there's five in here. And I, I'd like you in your own time to go back and, and look at all these blessings that flow out of a person's life who's dwelling on the attributes of God. Verse 8, they feast on the abundance of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your delight. <laughs> they feast on the abundance of your, of your house. Sometimes I think Christians give off this vibe to the outside world. Like to be a Christian is to follow the cosmic killjoy. This God who's just, he's called you to a boring life. And you don't really do anything. The adventure's gone. Gone. The spirit is gone. The enthusiasm for life. This is kind of what Christians give off. This vibe of like, welcome to Boringville right? Come be a Christian. Basically, we're really boring, and uh, you're not really going to do anything exciting in your life until you die. Have fun. And, and I think I, the, pro, the, the reason the world outside Christianity picks that up is because we give that vibe off. And, and you didn't read verse 8 with me. They feast on the abundance of your house. They, 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 you drink from the river of God's delight. To be a Christian is not to nibble on God's goodness. It's to feast on him and all of his fullness and all of his adventure and all of his delights on everything that is right and good and true and joy-filling and satisfying to the human soul. To be a Christian is to be alive in the fullness of God. It's to experience everything God designed the human soul for in all of its adventure. Yes, adventure. You were made for it. That's what the Imago Dei is, the image of God. You were made to live. It's the human nature to want to feast on all of God and live in all of his fullness. And only when you put your faith in Jesus Christ can you feast in that way. And some of you are still appetizing on God. You've been a Christian for how many years now? And you're still thinking, man, the... You know, the, the salted Brussels are all that God's got for me. <laughs> that was just the first appetizer. There's a row of appetizers going out that way. And guess what? When you get through the door, there's a whole main dish out there. And then when you get to the other side of that in your 60s and 70s, there's some dessert on the other side of that. You just wait till you get to that. It's more and it's more and it's more. Do not settle for a Christianity that settled for salted Brussels sprouts. When you got invited to a feast... This thing, there's, a, there's enough depth in here to keep you going for multiple lifetimes. You have been called to more. And the world needs to see Christians who are so hungry and enthusiastic for what God's called us to, a life of obedience and a life that is truly life, finding joy in the way God made the family, finding joy in, in loving your church and serving the poor and giving your goods away to, to, to just let the world see the goodness of Jesus. That's life to the full. And then having, having fullness so overwhelm you that you can't help but talk about Jesus everywhere you go. Why? Because you're feasting on him at home. You're feasting on him at home. Why is the world not interested? Because so many of us are just appetizing. Charles Spurgeon gave a wonderful illustration of this. He said, it's a little bit like a little boy whose dad just bought a mansion in the country. Just a mansion, like an estate in the country. And the dad brings the boy to the estate, and he says, go explore. And this little boy looks at the house, <sighs> and he walks in. And then there's like, there's, there's suits of armor around the, there's, and there's two stairs going up to different wings of the house. And he runs up the stairs and he opens one door and he peers in and he's just in awe as he's seeing this room. And then he, he runs down the hall to the next door and he, 
And then this kid keeps running. And with every door he opens, he goes, there's another room. And then he opens, there's another room. There's another floor. You got, there's another wing over there. Wait till you get, there's another wing, church. There's a whole nother wing. One of the reasons I preach with enthusiasm is because I'm enthusiastic about Jesus and I want you to catch it. Christianity is an invitation to feast on the goodness of God, to drink from the river of his delight. Don't settle for anything less. Don't settle for sin. It will rob you of your life. It will rob you of everything you were made for. Now, what do we do with this? Listen to his prayer at the end. Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoer lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. He closes this with a warning. You're either fooled in the house of sin or you're feasting in the house of God. If you're fooled today, may you not leave fooled. If God's bringing conviction over sin in your life right now, don't leave until you've done business with Jesus. You're going to have a three-song closing worship set after I get down from here. Three songs. Let that worship bubble up inside of you. Don't be looking at your watch. Whatever God is putting his finger on in you right now, determine in your soul it's gone before you leave here. Determine in your soul you're going to confess it to somebody in this room. You're going to pray with them. You're going to come to the deacons after service if you need to. This is not for, some, this is not for the person next to you. This is for you. It's for me. Don't leave the Sunday gathering and worship until you've done business with God. And if you're in here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, hear the final verse. There the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. There is a judgment that is coming. And I, I, I don't want to miss my chance to preach rightly to you. You need to make a decision about Jesus Christ. He has invited you to a feast that nowhere else in this world will invite you to. And if you choose not to follow Jesus, there is a judgment that comes and you will have to bear your sins before a holy God. And there is a death that awaits you. But if you will turn to Jesus, if you will trust in him, repent of your sin and receive the gift of grace, he will fully cleanse you from all of your sin and you will get to feast on the goodness of God as well. May you do that before you leave here today. Will you pray with me? Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for life. Thank you for the feast. We love you. I pray for this church as they reflect on the words of scripture today. Holy Spirit, do a wonderful work in this church. May the Holy Spirit flow freely. Lord, bring conviction. And Lord, bring victory in Jesus' name. With the blood of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the dead, bring full victory today. May no one leave here in partial victory. You didn't die and raise from the dead for us to live in 85% victory. You give full victory. That's my story. It's every Christian's story. God, bring victory today in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ray, for that message. Uh, now I invite you to stand as we respond in song. I once was lost in darkest night.
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun. Comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship your holy name You're rich in love And you're slow to anger Your name is great And your heart I will keep on singing The ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like death strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever holy. Uh, we just come to you recognizing that, uh, that you are holy, you are just, um, that you see our sins, that, um, that you are more aware of them than we are ourselves, and make us a people who are quick to confess them and come to you and recognize that you are faithful and just to forgive us. Amen.
again, thank you for joining us for the service today. As you go forth, please receive this benediction from Psalm 36. Sorry, uh, let me get there. <laughs> May you recognize the preciousness of the steadfast love of God. May you take refuge in the shadow of his wings. May you feast on the abundance of the house of the Lord and drink from the river of delight. May you recognize the fountain of life that our Lord provides and the light that he gives. If you need prayer in light of what Rafe shared today or the own examining of your heart that you've done, we do have deacons on the side who would love to pray with you. Otherwise, um, go in peace. You are loved. <laughs>